start. I think there's a couple of people still coming in from outside. Um, you're all very welcome along. My name is Noel Cunniff, uh, for anyone who doesn't know me. And uh, this morning we're running a policy forum on storage and dispatch down. So uh, pretty interesting morning ahead, a lot of good presentations and also some, some news for you as well. Uh, good to see everybody has pulled themselves out of all the consultations which are out at the moment. Uh, I think there's enough out to justify that doll printer that was, that was bought. So, uh, I'm sure we'll keep them busy over the next few months drafting them back. Um, just before we get going, a quick reminder that the uh, IWEA competition compliance document is on our website. Just so everyone's aware, in the lead up to auctions, just be very conscious that we can't discuss price and, and other competitive things as well. So the full details are in the document. Um, we're going to wrap them through things quite quickly this morning. We have a fairly packed agenda. Um, so good to see that we're starting on time and actually buying David some time because there's no way he's sticking to 15 minutes, but we'll see. Uh, so first up, uh, Dave is going to uh, give just an overview of latest industry updates as well as some of the, the recent consultations that have come out. Um, and then we're going to get into the, the meet of the morning where we talk about dispatch down and storage. Um, so we've got Rory Mullen giving an overview of the dispatch down working group from 2019. We've got uh, myself giving an update on the clean energy package and the work that that group has been doing in relation to priority dispatch and, and dispatch down compensation. Uh, Paul Blunton is giving an overview of an SEI curtailment analysis study which has been carried out this year. Some really interesting information in that. Uh, then we've got Sarah Armstrong who heads up our All Island Storage Roadmap Working Group in the Storage Committee and she's going to be giving an overview of a report that we're, we're launching this morning. And then we have Mark Turner from Baringa, who's on his way from the airport at the moment, and he'll be launching another report called Store Respond and Safe that we've been working on for the last few months. Um, then we're going to have a, a Q&A panel for about a half hour, uh, and then break for lunch, which will be just outside, and you're all welcome to join us for that as well. Um, before we get into things this morning, I just want to introduce something that we've been working on in IWEA for the last few months, uh, uh, an evolution of our storage committee into uh, a, a new brand called Energy Storage Ireland. So this is going to be a, a breakaway uh, from the, the storage committee into uh, an entity of itself, just a more independent voice for storage uh, in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, it will carry the same function as our current storage committee and ideally will be attracting a couple of new members that aren't necessarily too interested in the wind industry <coughs> but are bought into storage as well. And to help us with the launch of, of this brand, uh, it's still early days, we're going to do an official launch in Q1 next year, but we've got two reports coming out this morning, which are already on our website, which you're going to get presentations on. So we've Store, Respond and Save, and we've got our Energy Storage Future, which is our all-island roadmap for storage in the future. So with that, uh, I might hand over to David to get things going. And uh, good morning. Cheers, thanks for having So good morning, so these policy forums, traditionally we just start with an introduction of where, just where different things that are going on outside of the topic we're focusing on. I'm going to keep it very short and sweet, more of a kind of roadmap type of style presentation where I'll point you to some of the things that are ongoing within IWEA, but not necessarily deep dive into them. But there's links in the slide themselves that we sent around afterwards, and you can click on the links to go and see full blown detailed presentations about most of the topics. I think just to start, to just remind everyone, when we do these quarterly dashboards every quarter now, they're usually a quarter behind. So the last one we have is into Q2. We'll be very soon getting the one for Q3. It just gives an update on where the industry is at every quarter, how things are developing. So we give things like how much electricity has come from wind so far in the year, how many projects have got planning, how many projects are being built. So it gives a snapshot of where the industry is at. And the good news is it's been a very another very good year. We're looking at coming very close, I'd expect, to about a third of Ireland's electricity coming from wind energy this year. So keep an eye out for the next quarterly dashboards that, that come out over the next, uh, next while. The other exciting news about all of this is Ireland is now number one in Europe for onshore wind as of last year. So not for wind overall, Denmark is still ahead of us when you combine offshore and onshore, but ultimately onshore wind on its own is now 29% of Ireland's electricity last year. Denmark was at 28, so it's the first time we've ever exceeded Denmark for onshore wind penetration, and hopefully over the next number of years we can catch up a bit on the offshore side as well. It does put into context though just what Ireland is achieving. I was over at a conference in Denmark in September, presented these numbers, and the Danes fully aware of how much more challenging it is for us to do this on an island versus them as part of a continent, burst into a random spontaneous round of applause when we <coughs> saw these type of numbers for an island and what's being done. So it is an astonishingly high level of variable renewable electricity being achieved 
for an isolated power system on the very edge of Europe. The other exciting news in the industry as a whole is the Climate Action Plan. One of the really interesting things when you delve into the numbers, this thing on the right hand side here is a chart from the Climate Action Plan itself. It outlines how much carbon the government wants to save over the next 10 years via the different measures across electricity, heat, transport, forestry, agriculture, so on. When you look at the numbers, the Climate Action Plan aims to save 16 million tons of CO2 a year by 2030. 8 million tons of that, well maybe just short of 8, 7, 7 to 8, will come from wind energy. So on and offshore wind will make up almost half of all the carbon the government is looking to save in the Climate Action Plan. That just shows that we haven't just delivered in the past, we're very much core and center to what's looking to be delivered over the next decade as well. And that's all wrapped around the 70 by 30, let's say, target that has now been set. We have officially got now a 70% renewable electricity target. The last piece of that jigsaw is the National Energy and Climate Plan, which is what the government have to send an official plan to Brussels before the end of the year, which will lock us into that target for every government for the next decade. So it's currently government policy, and that government will hopefully last for at least another few weeks until that plan is sent across to Brussels, and then it's officially locked in as a decade-long target. Once it's locked in at Brussels, the rules of the Clean Energy Package say you can only negotiate downwards. So we have, let's say, 70 then as a minimum target for, for 2030. I suppose what we've been working on since this 70% target was set, so we got a first indicator at our March conference this year that this might be happening when the Joint Oireachtas Committee members at our conference suggested that they were going to support this. Not a few weeks later, Minister Root came out and confirmed it would be part of his climate action plan. Since then, our 70 70% committee, which Paul Bunn chairs, has been going from, let's say, trying to show how you can run a system at 70% to trying to put together the pieces of the jigsaw that we actually need to fit together to deliver this. So not actually how it could look, but what do you actually need to do to actually step by step meet it. So first thing we did was we looked at well, how much wind energy is out there. And we developed this pipeline. We interviewed members and said, how many projects have you onshore and offshore? What stage of development are they at? And we mapped when are these projects expected to go into planning and begin their life of trying to get actually built. So you can have a look at the slide in more detail afterwards. It basically shows from projects that are at the planning phase, they have planning and now we've got grid, they have planning and grid and found a route to market, they have all of these things and they're currently under construction. We've mapped out for both the on and offshore supply chain, let's say, where they're at along that process. Big overall message is we have absolutely no shortage of on or offshore wind over the next decade to meet the targets that the government has set. On the onshore side, there's about 8,000 megawatts of projects at some stage of development. On the offshore side, there's around 12,000 megawatts of projects at some stage of development. Government targets are 4,000 and 3,500 respectively. So no shortage of projects to get there. What we are in big shortage of is time. We are under extreme time pressure to get that many projects through the different phases by 2030. And so Paul, along with the rest of the 70 by 30 committee, have been looking a lot at how, through a project life cycle, can we reduce the amount of time it currently takes to build a project. There's links up there to a presentation Paul gave at our autumn conference, which goes into this in much more detail than I have. I just wanted to give you a flavor. We have these nine policy asks that we believe, if we meet them, we can deliver at least the onshore wind side of the target by 2030. We're looking at a similar piece for offshore, so you can see the little lightning bolt and the little sun show where these overlap with offshore and solar. But we are also developing a specific one for offshore because there's some bigger ticket items that need to be resolved around the offshore side. Like, for example, it's hard to talk about how you do a consenting regime faster when you don't even have a consenting regime in the first place. So there's a bit more needs to be put on the bone around that yet, but it's still in progress. But have a look at the, the presentation. The other thing I'll mention is that Paul has been deep in an Excel sheet with the rest of the committee. It's not just a, let's say, hypothetically, how could this be done? This is modeled on a year-by-year -year basis. If certain things take this length of time, this is how many megawatts will be built by 2030. And then making <coughs> an assumption as to what the policies could do in terms of speeding things up, we can see then, do we get enough megawatts by 2030 or not? So it's very focused on the time it takes for a project to go through the different phases and how we can speed that up. We're getting a really good response from the decision makers by coming with this type of analysis because there's a need on both sides here for this work. We needed to work to be able to build the projects. 
the government needed to work to be able to meet targets. So having this type of analysis is really helping with trying to justify why are we asking for different things. So we're engaging a lot with the different stakeholders and showing this type of evidence. The other thing we have in parallel to this is <coughs> not only how can we build things faster, but how can we build them cheaper? So there's certain decisions that stakeholders are making right now that won't make it faster or slower, but will make it cheaper or more expensive. One of the easy ones to pull out of here is things like business rates, or the rates that are applied to wind farms. If they're increased, it just is an extra cost that we have to absorb. Time-wise, it doesn't necessarily change it, but price-wise, it very much does. It could then have knock-on impacts for things like corporate PBAs and so on. So we have a real incentive there to try and get price, especially pass-through prices like rates, as low as possible so we can offer wind energy for the, the lowest price possible. Again, this is our, our list. This is what we're, we're working on right now and going through. And again, there's a link to the top there to a full detailed presentation from Eberos about what these cost implications could be. What they've done is they've taken each of these uh, policy measures or regulations and they've looked at starting from a typical wind farm that was developed over the last 10 years, say at approximately 75 euros a megawatt hour, what would be the cost impact of these policies if they were implemented. Some of them will reduce the price, and that's this list, and some of them will increase the price if they go the other direction, and that's this list. So we have again tried to put into numbers what the impact of different decisions is. And you can see, depending on what policymakers do, we can go from being able to, let's say, halve the price of wind energy over the next 10 years to having a third extra cost on the price of wind energy. And it just shows how dependent we are as an industry on what policymakers decide to do. As you can see, one of the big ones at the start is the WAGS, the Wind Energy Guidelines, which are very topical right now. So the tip height that you're allowed to achieve, this, this first bar here shows what the difference is being able to use a tip height of 125 meters versus a tip height of 180 meters. So a huge reductions in cost if you can use a, a higher turbine. On the other side, we have the additional price of the noise restrictions that are in the wind energy guidelines. So in other words, if you have an extra restriction on the noise you can make, it means you have to shut down the turbine more. If you shut down the turbine more, you have a higher price of your overall energy you're producing. And we're trying to demonstrate that to policymakers. This is our big bugbear, I think, with what we've seen come out of the guidelines. They've put in these restrictions, but they haven't taken any account of what the other side of the situation is, which is higher prices for the consumer and making it more difficult to develop onshore wind into the future. Really disappointing to see that they didn't even have an appendix or something that would at least put some balance on that side, especially if you read their introduction to the whole thing, it says that the balance is to find a balance between local needs and cost implications. You would imagine you'd need to calculate the cost to do that balance, but so be it, they haven't. So that's our big message, is to try and make sure that that is part of the thing <coughs> when they finish the consultation and come to a final mark on, the, on where the, the balance is. So just to give people a quick rundown, because it's the wind energy guidelines only came out yesterday, this is a very rough and ready review, but just to let people know our initial reading of it, overall I would say it is as expected for the most part. I'd say around setback, so the first one noise, I might just leave that to the last one because it's probably the most complicated, but our current positions, which have been approved by council for a year now and we don't intend on changing, is we will accept the setback by showing the pain that that is going to have for the industry in terms of the amount of land that's going to be lost to develop onshore wind, but as an acknowledgement of balance, showing that we're willing to come to the table with showing that we can create some sacrifices and give something on the other side. I think four times setback, it still leaves us with a very good land mass to be able to develop projects, so it's survivable. Not pleasant, not something we want, but at least we still have an industry we, we can work with. Shadow flicker, it's something we can implement as long as there's some caveats around shutting down the turbines and having some time to do that. Accepting the fact that there's a general consensus that you need to have your grid consent now for building a project and undergrounding cables where possible, as long as it's possible. And it seems like the security stuff is generally in line with what we would expect, although there's just a few funny and fluffy <coughs> wording about it somehow that we need our community engagement committee just to have a look at and see if it's, if it's all okay. So for example, the two euros a megawatt hour is defined as a benchmark. I'm not sure what a benchmark is in government regulations, but it doesn't seem to be that you have to do it, but it's putting a number in as a guidance of, of some sort. So I'm not sure how that will all filter out. I think the big one for us is the noise. So the, the feedback we're getting from our acousticians who've had a few hours yesterday to review it is 
that the method in us, it would simply be impossible to implement it. It doesn't actually sit together. In other words, the government had taken about three or four different standards, grouped them all together and said, now do that. In the world of noise, I'm told that's not how noise standards work. You can't just pick pieces of different ones and put them together. It makes it very difficult to actually implement. And also the limits that are being set are extremely low. Probably the, from an initial reading, we see them as probably the harshest noise restrictions in the world that we can come across. Definitely the harshest in Europe anyway, from a comparison that we in Europe did for us before. So we've been working on trying to get the message out there that this, you know, very fine if it had no consequences, but based on the work that Everose have done, you know, this noise restriction is putting two and a half billion euro on the consumer's bill for developing the 4,000 megawatts of wind we need over the next 10 years. That's a hell of a bill to be putting on the consumer to be trying to get noise levels at such a low level. So in our view, not a balance. And hopefully we can move the dial back a touch on what that balance should be. Just so you know, our request is that they apply the ETSU slash good practice guide that's used in the UK well-proven standard, tried for five or six years now, proven to be effective in the UK. In Northern Ireland, for example, there's only five complaints a year against wind farm around noise. That's an extremely low number out of 12,000 noise complaints across all sectors. So we can point to showing that it is effective in the area it's, uh, it's implemented. <coughs> Finally, how are we doing? No, I haven't started throwing things at you no, yet, so you're fine. Just to <laughs> fill people in, last week we launched another new report in the series that is our outlook for the next 10 years. So I'll just briefly put in, this is, and it might not seem important to this, I think it's just, especially for this discussion today around storage, will only become apparent, I think, when you think of this in the context of the price review that the SOs are currently undergoing. So let's say that at the start of the year in January, we released this report called Win for a Euro. That's where we looked at what has been the cost to the consumer of uh, not just the PSO, but the savings on the wholesale market that wind energy has saved by being a zero marginal cost technology on the market. Looking at the cost of the PSO, those savings, how do they stack up? And over the last 20 years, we came to the result that it has cost the consumer about a euro per person per year to have wind energy. Much lower than I would say many of the mass media might portray it to be, or many of the discussions might expect it to be. Only last week, we had a representative from the Department of public expenditure come out and say that they think an evaluation like this needs to be done. We said, there you go. You know, it's, it's, it's really disappointing the government don't have these type of things themselves, but at least we're filling a gap now by putting numbers on it so fairy tale numbers don't take over the vacuum in between, like you might see in some of the dialogue. After, we also had in parallel to that the 70 by 30 work. The 70 by 30 work, which, which Mark also laid on, that looks at how does the whole system work if you have 70% renewable electricity. So it doesn't just look at the electricity market or the PSO, it looks at the grid, DS3 costs, integration costs, the whole full package. And that's where Mark and his team told us that if we can as an industry meet 60 euros a megawatt hour on average over the next 10 years, getting to 70% is cost neutral. So that was kind of a benchmark set for us. Um, if as an industry you can reach that point, you're doing 70% at the same price as if you continue to rely on fossil fuels. If you can do it for less than 60, you're saving the consumer money. And this is to drive home the message that renewables are now becoming really good value. <coughs> to build on that then, and to kind of mirror the win for a Euro report, we went a bit deeper in cheaper and greener and said, well, let, rather than looking at the whole picture, let's just look at the future impact on the PSO and the future impact on the electricity market. And so if you move from a 40% renewable electricity system a 70% renewable electricity system. This is what Priory calculated us for. If you have an average strike price of 60 euros a megawatt hour, this is the price to the PSO of doing that. So at some times we'll be giving money back to the PSO, at other times the PSO will be giving money to us. And overall that would come at a cost to the PSO of just over <coughs> 3 billion. That might sound like a very bad news story and no doubt will be presented as an additional cost to the consumer. But what we're trying to highlight is all of this zero cost renewables on the electricity market will drive down the average price on the wholesale market quite significantly to the extent of almost 6 billion euro if you develop the 70% renewable electricity system as well. And what we're showing is the net cost to the consumer then is, two and a, is a 2.5 billion saving. In other words, if you look at the price of the PSO, but you look at the savings on the wholesale market, the overall net saving to the consumer is actually 2.5 billion. This is critical for two things. One, in the messaging around renewables. Yes, we might have an increasing PSO, 
for the CRU especially, you have to start communicating the savings that are also coming as a result of implementing these renewables. The second thing that's really important around this message, and this is drawing me back to the price review conversation, this saving to the consumer of two and a half billion is effectively like a budget for air grid and ESP networks to do all the other things you need to do in accommodating more renewables on the system. So building grid, doing system services. This is like a, a budget that we're giving them to say, you do spend this money, and if you spend it or less than that, it's coming out of saving to the consumer. And what we've tried to show in Cheaper and Greener is why our costs should be very interesting for air grid and ESP networks and the CRU. Because that saving of two and a half billion is assuming that the average strike price is 60 euros a megawatt hour. However, if we could have an average price of 50 euros a megawatt hour, that saving becomes four billion. In other words, if we could just have a 10 euro megawatt hour saving on our average costs, the money available for the rest of the system to do their job is enormously higher. That's a one and a half billion jump in potential extra budget, let's call it that, that air grid and ESP networks could have to do their job without increasing the cost of the consumer overall. And that is why things like rates or WEGs shouldn't be just an interest for us, it should be very interesting for a lot of the other stakeholders as well. So look, that's other things going on in IWEA. There's a few links in there, a lot of studies going on in the background. You can have a look at any of the detailed presentations around the cost and, and the time savings. I think the rest will be to go deeper into the system services. So hopefully you get the slides out. <coughs> so I'll give it back to you now. Cheers, David.